Hey everyone, welcome to our presentation on our week six screening, Eileen, Life and Death of a Serial Killer, presented to you by Jesse, Marie and Jessica. The film is British documentarian Nick Broomfield's second documentary about America's first female serial killer that documents Eileen's experience on death row, focusing in on her mental state during the lead up to her execution. Eileen was a hitchhiking prostitute who was convicted of killing several men in Florida between 1989 and 1990. Eileen had allegedly killed the men who were clients while working out of self-defence and maintains this claim throughout her conviction. This wasn't believable for either the judge or the jury as she had a body count and Eileen was jailed and sentenced to death row where the rapid decline of her mental health began. At the end, she even believed illusions that her mind was being controlled by radio waves. Broomfield conducted her last interview with her before her execution at the request of Eileen herself. He developed a close relationship with her over the filming of two documentaries, leading to a rather exposing scenes that revealed some potentially unethical approaches. This, along with the social, political and historical context, as well as key issues and public responses surrounding the film, is what we will be exploring in this presentation. Now, Marie will take us through the film's context. Eileen Warners was born Eileen Carol Pittman in Rochester, Michigan in 1956. Her mother, Diane Warners, was 14 years old when she married Eileen's father, 16-year-old Leo Dill Pittman. Two months before Eileen was born, Diane had filed for a divorce. Eileen's father was incarcerated at the time of her birth and was later diagnosed with schizophrenia and soon after convicted of sex crimes against children. Eventually, in 1969, he passed away by hanging himself in prison. But let's take it back to 1960. Four years after her parents split, Eileen was coming to just about four years of age. Her mother, Diane, had abandoned her and her older brother, Keith, leaving them with their grandparents. Eileen confesses in the film that by the age of 11, she had already begun engaging in sexual activities in school in exchange for things like cigarettes, food and drugs, and rumours had flown around that she had also engaged in sexual activities with her brother. Her grandfather was also allegedly an alcoholic who had sexually assaulted and stripped her out of clothes before beating her when she was a child. And at the age of 14, Eileen became pregnant having been raped by an accomplice of her grandfather's and gave birth to the boy at a home for unwed mothers. A few months passed and Eileen had dropped out of school, while her grandmother passed away due to liver failure. Her grandfather was distraught and blamed Eileen for her grandmother's death, claiming it was Eileen's behaviour that led to the stress and killing her. It wasn't long before her grandfather threw her out of the house by the age of 15, to which Eileen began living in the woods near her home and supporting herself by working as a hitchhiking prostitute. When we look at the state of Michigan during that era, we know that it was just recovering from World War II. According to InfoPlease's history on Michigan, we see that in the early 1960s, economic growth lagged and unemployment became a problem in the state. The 1980s recession saw a slump in car sales. This led to a majority of factories shutting down and caused Michigan's unemployment rate to top out at over 15%, being the nation's highest. All of the aforementioned considered, Eileen was a product of terrible circumstances not only in relation to her upbringing, but also the era that she was raised in. Being a victim of abuse has a deep psychological impact, let alone pairing it with homelessness and widespread economic recession around her, leaving little to no opportunities for other work. Now Jessica will be touching on the key issues and problems raised by the subject matter, as well as the film's approach to the subject matter. The documentary raises multiple issues and problems in relation to both Eileen herself and Broomfield's approach to the film. First of all, Eileen was labelled as America's first female serial killer by the media and the film surrounding her and her crimes. However, according to Schlitt, most of the claims and statements surrounding Eileen's case were exaggerated, and it's important to debunk them from the get-go. To be more specific, Schlipp believes that Eileen was not America's first female serial killer, stating that women have been murdering serially for as long as men, though their crimes are usually family members or acquaintances, and they most often choose poison over other means of disposal. Eileen killed strangers with a gun, an unusual but not unprecedented fact that the media seized upon and ran with rampantly. 
On top of that, rumours of Eileen's prostitution activities were ridiculously exaggerated. Second of all, it's widely known that the film was directed by Nick Broomfield. What we don't commonly note, however, is that his former wife, Joan Churchill, was also a director and the camera operator. This moment is exposed in the scene with the glass-separated interview where Eileen believes that Greenfield is alone and that the camera is turned off before revealing that she still believes her crimes were an act of self-defense, even after finally pleading guilty in order to receive a death sentence. Hear Greenfield's voiceover saying, Eileen waited until she thought we weren't filming to talk about the murders. The next shot is of Broomfield's profile as he leans closer to the pane of glass where we hear her whisper that it was in fact an act of self-defense but that she cannot admit it on tape. They're so corrupt. It's not funny. So I've got to go down. I have to. That's why I can't say nothing about self-defense on tape or anything. Then as Eileen leaves the interview room, Churchill appears on the screen holding the camera and the two women acknowledge each other. Eileen, still unaware that Churchill had been secretly filming her, says it was nice to see her. Therein lies another issue as Eileen was unaware of Churchill's presence up until she had already left the interview room. According to Horrock, Churchill's sudden and unexpected appearance in the documentary is an unintended moment of disruption, which calls attention to the constructed nature of Greenfield's on-screen persona as the lone male investigator. As much giving Eileen the impression that what she was divulging was off the record is one of the key issues. But what takes it further is Broomfield failing to make Eileen aware of Churchill's presence as she may have thought she was confiding in Broomfield alone. The third and most problematic issue of all is the close relationship between Broomfield and Eileen. Hey, how you doing? and how Broomfield uses this to his advantage as a means of exposing the truth, despite the unethical matches he went to do so. While Broomfield says that he did not intend to trick Eileen deliberately, he felt it was important the truth be heard and that it was a difficult decision for him. Horrock says that others might contend that at least Broomfield and Churchill openly showed us the documentary process by revealing the covert. But what she finds most interesting to examine, however, is how the above scene positions the audience and how that relates to the distinctions between truth and performance. That is to say, the film suggests that it is only when Eileen stops performing for the camera, the truth emerges. Now, Jesse will be touching on the mind relevant to this documentary. In this film, it is clear that Broomfield utilised the investigation slash report model which consists of assembling evidence to make a case and offer a perspective in the participatory mode. An interaction and dialogue between the filmmaker and the talent is also present, rather than the subject simply talking, and this can be clearly seen in the film. However, a filmmaker is not obliged to follow one specific mode or model, and as such, we see that Broomfield has also incorporated elements of the observatory mode, a fly-on-the-wall style of filming and the expository mode, where priority is given to the spoken words to convey content as opposed to what we may see, and calls for a voiceover to frame the film. Eileen was right about the cops and their movie deals, but in her paranoia, she also believed that the police had known about the first murder, but allowed her to become a serial killer. Now, Marie will explore the questions of ethics, responsibility and representation in relation to the film and its producers. As the documentary is heavily portrayed from Broomfield's perspective that Eileen was a victim, he undoubtedly took actions to capture the images that he wanted in both ethical and unethical ways. From the get-go, Broomfield's bias towards Eileen is pretty clear, not saying that she murdered fairly, but that he believes that it was self-defense and that her downfall was due to police corruption. As such, most of the evidence provided by him supports these claims. He also had a tendency in the film to portray the police and Eileen's first attorney as corrupt, money-hungry individuals and involved her close friends who were presented as clean and social. These friends hardly talked ill of her, simply reiterating that she was troubled. So Broomfield makes use of this disturbed past narrative to expose Eileen's humanity and discount her for her actions. To top it all off, the film is lacking in mentions of the victims and their loved ones, further supporting the idea that Broomfield had a bias. 
Instead, the documentary retracts from showing graphic images and uses archival footage to describe her actions. We have considered that this might have been an ethical decision to respect the victims, but it could also undeniably be an attempt to pull Eileen away from the negative light, in line with the film's message. As mentioned previously, another one of Broomfield's questionable actions is seen when interviewing Eileen on death row and he misleads Eileen to think that the cameras are off, causing her to unknowingly reveal the truth on camera. At this point, Broomfield chose to prioritize content over the subject. He chose to shot what, from an ethical point of view, should not have been shot, or at the very least, should have been excluded. In this scene, Broomfield's actions are seen as problematic as he exposes himself manipulating and deceiving Eileen, someone whom she trusted dearly. In the last interview, he confronts her with the information gathered from interviewing her biological mother and says that she asks for Eileen's forgiveness. My mother died, and let me tell you something, she plopped me out of her belly, left me with my grandparents, and we never knew her. So tell that damn whore, I could give a fuck if she even had me. She had me and left. She asked you for your forgiveness. She can go to hell. The rage from Eileen's response makes this scene particularly disturbing, but it aptly shows all the hurt that she had felt and the troubled past that she's trying to forget. Now Jessica will be touching on public responses to the film as well as other consequences in regards to the subject matter. There is a range in the public response to this documentary as there were various media pieces about Eileen that didn't include her as heavily as Broomfield's documentary. Broomfield was praised for the reality he helped shed light on. The Guardian's John Patterson attests to this saying, no acting can compete with such reality. On top of that, Rolling Stone's Peter Travers suggested that Eileen makes a better Eileen than Theron, a popular view shared amongst the reviewers. Viewers also agreed that other films like Patty Jenkinson's Monster had fictionalized Eileen and that Broomfield's search of the truth triumphs overall. As much as Broomfield received praise for the film, he also received criticism for being too involved as a filmmaker and possessing a personal bias. For instance, a bulk of the film shows extensive reviews of Eileen herself and her close friends and visits her childhood home, and yet he spends virtually no time interviewing the loved ones of her victims. On top of that, Broomfield's comment in the documentary that it has been proven that the death penalty is no deterrent also shows that he is a liberal and very against the death penalty. As such, this does give the film a slant in Eileen's favour. Furthermore, the public agreed that the film demonstrates that the commercial motivations of those around Eileen made her look relatively honourable. Now, we are moving on to the techniques used in the film, which Jesse will present. Broomfield utilises a number of filmic techniques throughout the documentary. His intention to capture both Eileen's insanity and humanity through these techniques shines through. For one scene, whereby Eileen herself is being interviewed remain lengthy and uncut with minimal interruptions in order to generate a reality effect and give the viewer an increased impression of authenticity. Another technique employed is the usage of extreme close-ups of the subject as they visually represent the unknown extent of her mental disturbance and contribute to her monstrosity as well as demonstrate the several degrees of her anguish, almost using her face as a text to be read. In the film, we see original footage from her official police confessions that is followed by two freeze-frame images of Eileen in prison attire. She appears tired, grotesque and deformed, excuting her defiant and intimidating aura. These types of imagery serve as a representation of Eileen's uncertain condition of waiting and being suspended between life and death. While only shown momentarily in the film, these images are significant as they constitute the visual iconography of Eileen and are retained in the minds of the audience as well as frequently being used in reviews and public responses of the film. Apart from the visual, Broomfield also uses the clear pain and anger in Eileen's voice as indicators of traumatic experience. Another technique he uses in the documentary is the Barker-like effect. According to Mary Russo, freaks are defined as beings to be viewed. Traditionally, they are often caged and silent, while a barker narrates their exotic lives. We see this in the film as Broomfield narrates details of an indubitably strange and tragic life. 
They were selling her story, the story of America's first female serial killer. While well, images of the subject, handcuffed or shackled, are presented to us. On top of that, the film utilises several images of Eileen fuming against the world, shouting at journalists as if she is ushered into cars, accompanied by the commentary of none other than Broomfield himself. That wraps up the techniques used in this film. Now Marie will take us into an open discussion. Here are some questions that we have in mind for our open debate. Number one, was Broomfield unethical about the handling of some of the footage? We felt that betraying Eileen's trust was indeed problematic and no doubt one of the biggest ethical issues found in the film. The confidential information that Eileen divulged while thinking the cameras were off added substantial value to the film, but it definitely wasn't validated from Eileen. On the other hand, we acknowledge that if this weren't added to the film, it would have left Eileen's ultimate claim bare and not compelling. However, as J. Ruby states, the time when a reporter could rely on the principle that the public's right to know is more important than the individual's right to privacy, the time when people believe that a journalist's primary ethical responsibility was to be objective, fair and honest is over. As such, all in all, we believe that Broomfield was unethical about the handling of the footage. Number two, was Broomfield too involved with the narrative? Did his relationship with Eileen result in a bias for the making of the film? Yes, we found that his close relationship with Eileen was a problem and how he used it to his advantage to expose the truth was one of the more ethical issues that ensued. However, whether his personal relationship with Eileen resulted in a bias or whether the bias came first, we cannot confirm. We can only speculate. Number three, how would we have handled the footage differently than Broomfield? First and foremost, we certainly would not have pressured Eileen into divulging information that she does not want to share. Secondly, we would not have filmed her without her knowledge or led her to believe otherwise. We do acknowledge that, in the heat of the moment, being a director of such a film, chasing mind-boggling secrets like this, it could be challenging to overcome the urge to film. However, we agree with Jay Ruby's view in that it is a new age, and being an investigator no longer comes with just the ethical responsibility to be objective and fair, but it also comes with the responsibility to be respectful to their subjects and their privacy. Now, Jessica will wrap up the presentation for us. To wrap up, we as a group believe that while Broomfield had a compelling subject as well as a positive and close relationship with Eileen to be able to retrieve information, he handled the material poorly. While he managed to successfully convey the fiery and melancholic emotion behind Eileen through the use of aesthetics, he betrayed Eileen's trust on multiple occasions and this is a huge ethical issue. What were your thoughts on the film? Let us know in the discussions page on Canvas.